So this is module one of the Blue Book PSAT, and I'm going to walk through this whole module in this video and then module two in a separate video. I'll just note that I'm not using the Blue Book app here. I instead have screen capped all the questions so that I could annotate on the screen and also not be limited by the clock, which makes it hard to kind of, you know, talk through the questions in the amount of time that you're given. So starting with number one, and so we've got our, our little batch of words in context questions, but we want to focus on the passage, not the words to begin with, and think of a synonym for this word that's underlined. So the sun was shining and a little wind was blowing. Not a blank wind, but one which came in delightful little gusts and brought a fresh scent of newly turned earth with it. So you note that I crossed it out because most of the time on these questions, you're just going to have a blank. But even when you have an underlined word, you don't want to get distracted by that word. Instead, you want to use the clues that are given elsewhere in uh, the passage. And here, I'm going to say, you know, delightful little gusts, and it brought a fresh scent. So that means it's not a negative kind of wind, not a bad wind, not a, not a harsh wind or a uh, severe wind or something like that, but not a harsh wind, not a harsh wind. Did I see that out of the corner of my eye? Maybe. I don't know if I did or not, actually, but that would have been the first word to come to mind. So a scratchy wind, I mean, I don't know how wind could really be scratchy unless it were somehow blowing sand. Basic wind doesn't make sense, and then vague wind. And so sometimes what they're going to do with the wrong answers on a question like this where they have an, an actual word instead of just a blank is that they might give you words that could have been a synonym so like maybe like a rough draft a basic draft a rough texture scratchy uh, a rough idea a vague idea but no we want harsh in the 1960s Sam Gilliam a black painter from the southern United States became the first artist to drape painted canvases into flowing shapes Okay, he later explored a different style, doing something with quilt-like paintings inspired by the patchwork quilting tradition of capital B black communities in the South. So, I don't know, creating, fashioning, creating. And well, you know, it is module one, and so module one is gonna be a little less challenging than module two, provided that you do well on module one and get the hard version of module two. Uh, but I don't want to give the impression that it's, you know, that it's necessary to guess the right word. It's more about coming up with some idea of what we're looking for so that we are not being guided by the answer choices. We want to be guided by the passage and the clues in the passage. But I think it would be strange to talk about an artist refusing, predicting, or hiding painting as, uh, uh, at least in the context of this passage. So we're just going to move on to number three. Same kind of question. While we, can, while we can infer information about climate activity in Earth's distant past from physical evidence, we cannot observe past climates directly. To study Earth's climate in action, we must blank that climate using computer models that represent various climate conditions. Okay, and so what is, what would you use computer models to do? Well, I'm just gonna say, obviously that's not gonna be the correct answer, I, I doubt it. We must model that climate. I mean, that's a really basic word, but it's based on the evidence. So model or simulate, simulate, create a simulation of that climate. So we're not inventing a climate, exaggerating a climate, or preserving a climate, but simulate. You know, you put in the data and then you, uh, yeah, like you simulate it, you model it. And those would be really close synonyms in that context. Although the playwrights hoped that their play would be blank when performed live. So here we've got a contrast word, although. And we have another word that indicates a contrast. Critics generally agreed that the performances had the opposite effect. 
wearying audiences, making them tired or worn out instead of energizing them. So that means that the playwrights had hoped that their play would be somehow energetic. And again, that's not going to be the correct answer. I doubt it it would be, but it's going to lead us, or it should lead us to it. And it is. The correct answer is going to be C, rousing. So arouse, rouse, they don't mean the exact same thing, but if you rouse someone from their slumber, you wake them up. If you arouse someone, you stimulate them. Uh, so wearying... We don't. Uh, a lot of times they're going to give you, an, an, if you have a contrast, one of the wrong answers is going to be something that contrasts with the correct answer. But wearying, here I, maybe we can use this to emphasize that weary is not the same as wary. If you are wary of something, you're on the lookout for it. You're aware, weary, you're tired, you're weary, you're worn out. So multifaceted just means it has, well, multiple angles or facets or aspects. And the others, I think you know what those mean, but they're not going to be the right words here. And on to a little more reading comprehension style questions. So the main purpose. Following is adapted. So in these questions, I would read the introductory portion because it'll give some context for what follows. So the narrator and his wife have recently moved to the southern United States, and Julius is their carriage driver, so like a horse and carriage. Julius was very useful when we moved to our new residence. He had a thorough knowledge of the neighborhood, was familiar with the roads and the water courses, knew the qualities of the various soils and what they would produce, and where the best hunting and fishing were to be had. He, had, he was a marvelous hand in the management of horses and dogs. So it, the purpose of the passage is to explain... Uh, you know that that Julius was very helpful, and uh, and in what ways he was helpful. Definitely not A. B is too narrow. It's too narrow, and this is something to be aware of on these questions. A lot of times they'll mention some specific detail that's part of the passage, but it doesn't mean that that is the main purpose of the passage. C is not supported. It doesn't say that. How about that? So, Julius was helpful. You don't want to overthink it on these questions. Just read it and think, okay, what is this passage doing? What is it doing? What is it saying? And that should lead you to the right answer. You want to be confident in your ability to summarize it so that you don't get distracted or, or persuaded by an incorrect answer that is, um, again, maybe mentioning some detail that's only a, a passing detail main purpose again. So by combining indigenous and classical music, this composer creates works that reflect the diverse cultural landscape landscape of Canada. For her album Orchestral Powwow, Dirksen composed new songs in the style of traditional powwow music. New songs that were accompanied by classical arrangements played by an orchestra. Yeah, they could have written that more clearly, but anyway. But where an orchestra would normally follow the directions of a conductor, the musicians on orchestral powwow are led by the beat of a powwow drum. So here we can say Chris Dirksen combines uh, elements of... I, we didn't need to write elements of, but elements of uh, you know, indigenous and classical music combines varied influences in her work now a could be tempting i'm going to put a question mark beside it and we'll come back to it b it's not arguing that she should be recognized for creating a new style of music i mean it's saying that their new songs in the style of a traditional kind of music not talking about difficulties and it's not establishing a contrast so what I was a little unsure about with a was the, the how part but it does talk about how it does talk about how I was thinking more just that it says that she does it but it does say how in the sense that you know it gives some details about you know the ways in which these things are blended
So that would definitely be A. And here I'm going to say, um, oh, yeah, it is a question. It's a, it's a sentence, but it's also a question. Usually these will say uh, the underlying sentence, but again, yeah, it's both here. It's a question and it's a sentence. Okay. How lifelike are they? Many computer animators prioritize, give priority to this question as they strive to create ever more realistic environments and lighting. Generally, while characters... Okay, so it's a question that computer animators prioritize, but I'd still say we want to keep reading. Okay, generally, environments and lighting are carefully engineered to mimic reality, but some animators are focused on a different question. Rather than asking whether the environments and lighting they're creating are convincingly lifelike, Patel and others are asking whether these elements reflect their film's unique stories. So it's a question that receives different amounts of emphasis. So a question that uh, different animators answer differently. Okay. Um, you know, answer in the sense of, you know, maybe that's not the best way to put it, but they, they sort of, again, they place a, di some animators place more emphasis on this than others. Well, it is, A is true as far as it goes. I mean, it does reflect a primary goal that many animators have, but it, it, it ignores the, the broader... I'm going to put a question mark by it, but it ignores what the passage is, is doing as a whole, because the passage says that, yeah, many of them have this, but not all. Um, no, I would say that B is the opposite. No, it's not about how to create realistic animations. Well, it's not about audiences. Okay, so I initially thought that A was not going to be correct. But it's going to have to be correct. Okay, many computer animators prioritize this question. So that means it is a primary goal for many animators. Yeah, many but not all. Many but not all. Okay, so it will be correct. It will be correct. But that's uh, still an example of how, you know, I think you, won't, you have enough time to read the whole passage, so there's no need to, to jump the gun um, and, just, and just immediately try to answer it because you need to know the text as a whole, what the text as a whole is saying to do well on those questions. Okay. What does the text strongly suggest about the site discovered by researchers? So I, we could put this is going to be classified under the central ideas and details portion, but it it's actually a kind of inference question. Strongly suggest. So we need to read the passage and again see what it says about the site discovered by the researchers. Okay, so blah blah blah. These people have reported the discovery of several egg clutches. And I think an egg clutch is like a group of eggs. Oh, nope. No, it's not. Uh, no, it is. It is. So this is a list of three things. Egg clutches, partially preserved single eggs, and egg shells. Okay. The researchers have concluded that the area was once a nesting and breeding site for titanosaurs, a group of sauropod dinosaurs. And don't worry about that stuff. I mean, uh, I, nobody is expected to be a, an expert on dinosaur types. So uh, the finding is significant given the lack of known nesting sites in northern regions of South America, which led many paleontologists to assume that titanosaurs migrated south to lay eggs. Okay, so here maybe a little diagram would be helpful. Um, uh, we've got South America, and we've got the north and the south, and so previously... Uh, um, I'm just going to say previously unknown in the sense that nesting sites in the north were previously unknown. They didn't know of any. And so the, 
that would mean that would mean that this is a uh, you know this indicates this is some new knowledge. It's if not the first, it's it's an it's a rare example of a nesting site. So with A, I'm going to say that's the kind of word that would be what I'd call an extreme word. You can also call it a superlative, if you prefer, but something that um, you know it's the earliest. It's not just early, but it's earliest, and that's usually a red flag when you see a word like that because it's it's hard to support a superlative, and especially when you have an inference, you don't want to infer an extreme like that. It doesn't talk about how difficult it was to excavate or dig up. The other thing about earliest is they weren't talking about time. They were talking about location. It is farther north. Now, D does. D might sound a little extreme as well, but this would be an example of one where um, it's, it is warranted by the, what's in the passage. It is farther north than any other nesting site discovered. It is significant given the previous lack. And I guess we could say lack in this case means they didn't know about any of them in the northern regions. And so... That would be again a case where, hey, it's it's it sounds a little bit a little bit uh, extreme, in a sense, but it is supported because there weren't any there before, or there weren't any uh, known examples before. Based on the text, how are polarons believed to be involved in the superfluorescence observed in these study? And let's not get uh, intimidated by the words. The important thing here is that this is going to be definitely an explicit detail question if it says based on or according to that means really you just need to, well you want to focus on finding that specific detail within the passage so how are polarons involved in its superfluorescence so in super superfluorescence electrical charges known as dipoles emit or give off light in synchronized timed bursts so intense that they are visible to the eye until recently this phenomenon has only been observed at extremely cold temperatures because dipoles cannot synchronize at higher temperatures but in a study this scientist and colleagues observed super superfluorescence at room temperatures in thin films made of perovskite and other similarly crystalline materials so you might uh, have the um, you know you might feel like like falling asleep when you read this or you might feel really intimidated but let's keep in mind that if they're gonna give you really technical sounding words like this chances are you know they're not expecting you to know what those words mean and so you want to avoid getting intimidated by those words as much as possible okay so what are they saying here I think the important thing is this. Previously, they had only been observed at extreme cold temperatures. Observed at cold temps. Extremely cold temperatures. Now, um, I mean, the, the contrast word suggests um, that they're not only observed at cold temperatures but at least can be observed at some kind of warmer temperature and the connection with warmer here is going to be thermal so thermal interference what on earth would that be well thermal has to do with heat and interference means you know getting in the way so if they had previously only been observed at cold temperatures but now there is something that protects them and let's keep in mind that the question was asking about polarons how are they involved well the polarons protect them from thermal interference so that means that the polarons um, you know have had an effect in terms of allowing this phenomenon super fluorescence to uh, you know sort of take place at warmer temperatures so it's not from one material to another. Temperatures. See, it's not talking about accelerating. And it's not about the intensity. So, again, I will grant that this is a, you know, it's it's kind of like the expression, the, the, bo the, the bark is worse than its bite you know, for a dog. This one is intimidating, but 
we try to avoid that intimidation factor and really focus on what they're asking about and try to connect the key words. And if you come up with a simplified answer like this one, it's going to help lead you to the actual correct answer and keep you from getting distracted by the incorrect answers. Data from the table to complete the text. Okay. The number and okay, we don't okay, the, the order that we want to go here is this. We want to read the passage first and use that as a guide for um, inspecting the table or the graph on these kind of questions. Because if you read it first, it's just kind of like, oh, there's a lot of information. I don't know what to do with it. So just save, you know, just go ahead and read the passage first. Okay, so two kinds of clamshell tools used by Neanderthals were dug up in a cave on the western coast of Italy. The scientist and her colleagues studied the tools and determined, determined that Neanderthals either collected clams that had washed onto the beach or harvested clams from the seafloor and then sharpened the shells to make tools. The highest number of tools from, made from clamshells was found at which depth? Okay, so we don't need to read the whole or inspect the entire table. We just need to find the depth at which the highest number of tools made from clamshells that were collected from the beach. Okay, so the beach, that's the important thing here. The highest number is there. That's a depth of three to four meters below the surface. Yeah, it's a little weird that they did this out of order, but the answer would be C. Data to complete the statement. Very, very short statement here. A student is presenting average monthly rainfall totals in various Puerto Rican cities for a science class. The student notes that in September, okay, so September, what do we see? Well, the main thing that stands out about September here is that three of these, this one, this one, and this one, are all really similar, and that's the highest. So San Sebastian had the highest. Nope. Nope. Yes. So they each have one that's below eight inches with eight inches being uh, right here. And that one is above eight inches. Nothing more to say about that one. Number 12, which quotation would best support the teacher's claim? So again, I'm gonna keep emphasizing that we want to read this and then f form an approximate answer. And on the quotation questions, we wanna first you know, inspect the claim and then there's gonna be a couple of key words usually that will guide us to the correct quote. So the student claims that Catlett had a talent for unifying various artistic traditions and styles. That's all we need here. Okay, so it needs to mention a variety of artistic traditions and then how those traditions were unified or brought together. And I would say that A is going to be correct because they love talking about indigenous this or that here, but in indigenous, Mexican, German, those are certainly of um, various artistic tra artistic traditions, and unifying and combining those basically mean the same thing here. Um, we just notice that there's no mention of other traditions there. There's no mention of uh, traditions there. And this is not, the, again, the traditions. This is depict who, it, who it's depicting. And so, yeah, the traditions, you know, the kind of ways of working, the, the influences or, as they say, aesthetic of these artists. And so definitely going to be A on number 12. Data to illustrate the claim. Interesting that they come back to, to this question type. 
Okay, so what is the claim? Ebooks became an increasingly popular means of reading in the United States in the 2000s and 2010s, though that popularity was concentrated in titles that are meant to be read straight through from beginning to end. For books in nonfiction genres that do not tell stories and that do require the reader to flip back and forth through a volume, they were less commercial success, commercially successful. Okay, so what we've got here are two different groupings. So fiction, and that would include romance and science fiction and fantasy, versus uh, cookbooks and travel guides, which would be nonfiction. And so what they're saying here is that these were less commercially successful. And I'm going to say that 2006 is not going to be where we'd want to focus because there's just not a big contrast one way or the other. Whereas if we look at those two versus those two, that's a pretty big difference. And this is also a fairly large difference as well. So we don't want to be looking at 2006. The percentage of 2016 cookbook sales that were ebook were I would say yes, A, A would work, but let's check the others. Now, we don't want 2006, and we don't want to make a comparison within the category of fiction. Again, that's making a comparison within the fiction category, and then that's making a, a, a comparison within the nonfiction category. We want to compare fiction to nonfiction, and so A is going to be the one that does that. Logically completing the text. And so here we want to be aware that these are very different from the questions that begin the, the module, the, the words in context questions. Here it's really important to read the whole passage and focus on the, the line of reasoning because it's going to lead up to a conclusion, as we can see here with the word thus. So we're just going to read it and sort of follow, again, follow the line of reasoning here. So colonized by Spain in the 1600s, New Mexico is home to a dialect of Spanish that differs significantly from dialects spoken in Spain's other former colonies in the Americas. Most notably, the New Mexican dialect retains older features of the language that other dialects lost in later centuries. But why would it have done so? New Mexico was so distant from population centers in Spain's other colonies, so bad map of United States, and then um, I'm embarrassed to even do this, but you know Mexico, <laughs> Central America, South America, uh, this isn't a geography class, but New Mexico would be kind of sort of roughly around there. Okay, so the idea is that it's isolated. It was so distant from other population centers or population centers in Spain's other colonies that it attracted few colonists after its initial colonization. Geographical isolation, in turn, I think commas before and after that would be nice, but anyway, geographical isolation, in turn, would have limited the exposure of New Mexican colonists to changes occurring to, this, this could have been written more clearly, would have limited the exposure, would have limited New Mexican colonists' exposure to changes occurring in Spanish grammar and vocabulary elsewhere. And that's just a complicated sentence. But the important thing is that geographic isolation would have limited exposure to changes in the language. So it suggest the extent to which isolation can influence language evolution, something like that. So, you know, geographical isolation can have an impact on the ways in which a language or variants of a language, dialects, can uh, evolve over time. That's not what they're saying. They're not talking about changes from one generation to the next. How about that? Yeah. 
So uh, the important thing here is to really stay on topic in terms of the factors that they're emphasizing because the wrong answers are either going to be, you know, irrelevant, they're going to focus on some other issue, or they might contradict the actual correct answer. Um, but it's not about whether they can understand. Again, it's how, how the language develops. Yes, that's it. That's it. Um, another logically completing the text question here. So, violins made by Stradivari and other craftspeople in the 16th to 18th centuries in Cremona, Italy, produce a sound that is considered superior to the sound of modern stringed instruments. Some experts have claimed that the type of wood used to create the violins is responsible for their prized sound, but modern and Cremonese violins are made of the same kinds of wood, maple and spruce. New analysis, however, has revealed unique indications that the wood in the older violins was chemically treated by the makers, leading researchers to suggest that the chemical treatment uh, is responsible for the whoa the superior sound of the older violins uh, maybe not wholly responsible for at least partly responsible because again it's not the wood it's got to be something that distinguishes these and so a is irrelevant it's not about other instruments at the time they were made it's about the old versus the new ones a method the chem the craftspeople used to alter the wood the chemical treatments that they applied to the wood c is no i mean imagine that they used uh like balsa wood or something that doesn't that's not reasonable balsa wood being a very thin type of wood uh, the current process of making violins is the same. No, same is another one of those kind of, uh, I would say, absolute or extreme words. You might, uh, you know, that, that would at least make me cautious. Because, you know, similar is, is not an extreme. Or comparable is not an extreme. But to say they're the same means that there's no changes whatsoever. And that's definitely a red flag and something to, to make you at least cautious of an answer choice. But B is going to be correct there. And so now we're on to the standard English conventions questions. And for those of you who have been preparing for the, um, what we call the paper SAT, the one that's still current in the United States as of 2023, these are going to resemble what you see in uh, the writing section, section two of the paper SAT. Uh, they're just isolated and not incorporated into bigger passages. Okay, so in 1903, Environmentalist John Muir guided President Theodore Roosevelt on a scenic, sprawling trip through California's Yosemite Valley. Upon returning from the three-day excursion, Roosevelt blank to convert the nation's wilderness areas. So, some kind of verb question, and it's going to be something to do with the verb tense, because it's not going to. There, with a subject-verb agreement question, they're not going to put the blank right next to the subject. So he vowed. Okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about something that occurred in 1903. So that is certainly something that took place in the past. That's the future. Uh, these, that's the simple present. And then that would be the present continuous or present progressive. But we don't want to use either of those present forms when we're talking about something that happened more than a hundred years ago. So we won't be there. And um, just glancing over here, we're, we can see that this has to do with possessives and or plurals because you've got uh, you know four answer choices where the only differences are here and here. And with these, you can really start with either of the nouns, whichever one you're more confident with, and then see which answer choices you can eliminate. Um, 
Joseph so and so and other Hawaiian musicians musicians introduced audiences. So the musicians did something to the audiences, namely they introduced the audiences to this, that, and the other. And so musicians is not going to be possessive. So musicians should just be spelled like this with no apostrophe. And so that means that any answer choice that has an apostrophe, whether it's after the S, which would indicate the plural possessive, or before the S, which would indicate the singular possessive, we can eliminate. And what do you know? That's enough to get us to our correct answer. Uh, if we had focused on audiences, we could have eliminated two. Um, but, you know, sometimes you might be more confident with one than you are uh, more confident about one than, than the other. But there's nothing possessive here. There, there, it's not like audiences' ears or musicians' talents or something like that. So there's no need for an apostrophe. Okay, commas or no commas. Let's see. While filming a boxing match for the movie Body and Soul, how had a had had a handheld camera operator wear roller skates? Okay, so. First thing here is that we're going to need a comma somewhere because that is a dependent clause or subordinate clause. It starts with while, which is a subordinator, and whenever you have that at the beginning of the sentence, you're going to need a comma to, uh, to separate that dependent clause from the independent clause that followed. How, had, blah, blah, blah. So that's an independent clause. So we will need a comma, and that allows us to eliminate D and C and then with A that's giving us an unnecessary transition word and and so what we can say here about the parentheses is that you know if there were no parentheses we would just have a comma after body and soul if you do need to insert parentheses you put the comma would go after the parentheses. Again, you don't always need a comma after parentheses. If it had said here, like, body and soul, 1947, you know, was a popular movie. I don't know if it was or not. But um, in that case, there's no need for a, a... We wouldn't have needed a comma in this situation, so we don't put a comma after it. One place where you never would have a comma in any circumstance would be right before parentheses. But here, it goes after the parentheses, and so it's going to be B. Another punctuation question here. At eight paragraphs long, the preamble to the Constitution of blank, a country in Western Asia. Okay, so this has to do with punctuating an interruption, an interruption or an appositive, you could say. And that appositive here or interruption is going to be this portion. A, not just A, but a country in Western Asia. And the idea with punctuating interruptions is that the punctuation needs to be symmetrical or it need, you need to pair the same punctuation marks and specifically those would those punctuation marks would either be the pair of commas a pair of parentheses or a pair of dashes so you use what is elsewhere in the sentence to guide you to your correct answer um, they're never going to make you choose between two different pairs when either of those pairs would be correct and um, you know there's no particular reason why they needed to use the dashes except maybe, hey, there's already another comma, and maybe that helps clarify that this is the interruption. But again, a pair of commas would have been okay. It's just that we've got a dash in that portion, and so we need the dash there. This is going to be a dangling modifier question, and I can tell you how to recognize that. Um, but let's just look at it. So after pleading for years... We can ignore that little part. After pleading for years for the, for the passage of key legislation, 
blank until their demands were addressed. So the modifier is going to be this portion. After pleading for years for the legislation. So we can turn that into a question. Who? Who or what? In this case it's going to be a who. Who pleaded for the legislation? And our answer needs to be, you know, the answer to that question is going to tell us what needs to go in the blank. So did pressure, did pressure plead for legislation? No, that doesn't make sense. Did a sit-in protest plead for legislation? Nope. Did lawmakers plead for the legislation? Mm, nope, it's, it's a little more logical than pressure or a sit-in because at least it's people, but no, it's the activists who, who did that. The activists did that. Okay, and so the activists increased pressure. And so, uh, yep, so this is a kind of thing where you can't really use your ear as uh, in other words with what sound in terms of you know going with what sounds right because a lot of times um, writers are pretty sloppy about this kind of thing and that includes writers on you know bloggers or even writers uh, in books I'll see these dangling modifier errors uh, quite frequently but they're very strict about it when they test on these questions and so the, the rule is when you have a modifier that opens a sentence, it needs to be directly followed by the thing that it's describing. And here, that thing, again, would be the activists. I think activists are not really a thing, but you get the idea. After immigrating... <laughs> tisk tisk tisk. If you, Im you immigrate with an I into... You immigrate with an E from... College board? You know better than that. After immigrating with an E from Mexico and obtaining U.S. citizenship, this person entered politics, earning a reputation for being a fervent or enthusiastic defender of Hispanic civil rights. In 1919, he was elected governor of such and such. In 1928, he became the nation's first Hispanic U.S. senator. Okay, so the important thing here, whether or not we put a comma after the year, I guess it doesn't really matter, but what we have here are two independent clauses. Lazarazalo was elected governor, and he became the nation's first Hispanic U.S. senator. So even though the pronoun he is referring back to the same you know, subject in the previous independent clause, we still have two independent clauses. And so that means our options here would be either to use a semicolon, a period, or a comma plus a conjunction, such as for, and, nor, but, or yet, so. But I would say this is kind of a semicolon situation, not that they're going to make us, yep, Yep, I would have thought semicolon because you've got the two relatively short uh, clauses that have a pretty similar structure. But we notice that, um, you know, it's going to have to be C. Because, you know, both B and A, you could say they're half right. B has the comma, A has the conjunction, but you need both of those when you're joining two independent clauses. And so it would be C. But the other, the semicolon or period would have also been correct. So now we're on to the transition word questions. So here what we want to do is read the passage and look at how, uh, focus on how the two sentences that are being connected, you know, how they relate. Okay, so, and we'll go ahead and read the whole thing. So, Carmen Amaya was well known or was known all over Spain for her powerful, powerful style of flamenco dancing. However, in July of that year, the outbreak of the Spanish Civil War made it difficult to perform in her home country. So that would be kind of negative. It's difficult. Blank. She left to perform abroad, dancing for audiences across North and South America. And I put that because a lot of times you have contrasts that go from negative to positive or positive to negative. We don't really have that here. What we have here is really more time. So, or cause and effect. So either consequently or subsequently. 
as a result. As a result. So, again, I was, you know, I was kind of, thankfully they didn't make us choose between consequently and subsequently, but I think this really is a consequence or result of the difficulty in her country. So, you know, because of that, she left to perform abroad. And so that's that. Same thing here. Focus on the passage, come up with a simple approximate answer, and uh, see how closely that gets how how close that gets us to the correct answer, and, and it should get us pretty close. So phytoplankton play a crucial role in the ocean's uptake of carbon from the atmosphere. So little little bitty little bitty uh, plant type creatures, uh, plant animal type creatures. Okay, when alive. These tiny marine organisms absorb atmospheric carbon via or by way of photosynthesis. After they die, they sink to the ocean or the seafloor where they do this. So I think this is really imp this is a sequence in time or a series of events. When alive, they do this. Then after they die, they do that other thing. Again, it's, I mean, you might look at this and see potential contrast. But I don't really think they're drawing a contrast here. Again, I think the first sentence is saying what the passage is about, <laughs> all three sentences of it. Um, and then the second sentence and the third sentence really elaborate on that. And so then, then, then next yes so we don't have a contrast which both B and C indicate in slightly different ways and then we're not getting more specific you know relative to some more general point which is what specifically would indicate the envelope shaped paper bags common in the US 150 years ago were impractical for carrying goods blank because they were the only paper bags that could be mass produced they dominated the market okay so this would be a contrast they were impractical but they still dominated the market still however nevertheless however so uh, yeah, so we're not restating something, we're not drawing a conclusion, and we're not giving an example. We have a contrast. And then on to what they call the rhetorical synthesis questions. And what I want to emphasize with these is that even though they're going to give you all these bullet points, 96% of the time, or maybe 99% of the time, you don't need to read them. And the reason for that is that if you focus on the question stem, it's going to give you a clue and um, in this case emphasizing the different orders in which they are classified and the thing is I've never seen them like give you some kind of incorrect information relative to what's in the the bullet points and so you, if you go through the answer choices and see that oh only one of these does this that's gonna to have to be correct okay but let's just see This doesn't talk, this only mentions one order. So we've got to talk about different orders. B does that. That's two different orders. That's only talking about one order. And that's only talking about one order. So you see, focus on the question stem and you should be able to eliminate the three incorrect answers without even needing to read the bullet points. This will be the only part of the uh, reading and writing section that I would really say that you can, s where you can eliminate or ignore the the passage, if we want to call that a passage, uh, because yeah, every uh, in every other case it is important to read the passage. Okay, emphasize a similarity. Emphasize a similarity. Okay. And what is that? What is the similarity in how critics responded? Okay, we need that part too. Nothing at well, that's that's only one critic or one publication. 
How about that? They praised it for its compelling narrative, and then <laughs> the Oprah magazine calling it this, and the economist, economist saying that, but both of them are focusing on the same aspect of it in terms of their praise. And then D is giving a contrast. See? So we don't want a contrast, we want a similarity, so we want C. And then finally, the student wants to make and support a generalization about honeybees. And when they ask for two things like this, that's something you definitely want to be aware of because one way they come up with incorrect answers on a question like this is to give you something that does one of those things. And maybe it does one of those things really well or really vividly. And you might be tempted to pick that answer choice, but you have to make sure it does both things. So cities tend to have a wider range of, that doesn't say anything about honeybees. That makes a generalization, but it doesn't support it. The strength of their diet depends on what they eat, and a varied diet is more available to bees in an urban area than to those in a rural area. Mm. I don't think that's... that's We put a question mark there, but I don't think that's going to be it. And then D, honeybees are more likely to thrive in cities than in rural areas. So that is a generalization. A general claim and then they support it with a reason because the very diet strengthens the bees immune systems so they're making it and they're supporting it and if we compare that to C it doesn't explain why the very diet is important and so our answer here would be D any questions uh, put them in the comments below and I'll see if I can address those in a follow-up video.